Hello, welcome in to Cup of Joe for June. We're just going right in it this month. Um, theme music, we're just put that on hold um, <laughs> for one month. Um, we'll, we'll just, we, we got so much to cover. We don't even have time for theme music this month. I think. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Mike Carrazzo, the content manager here at Ryerson. Joined always Nick Webb, who is our director of risk management, commodities hedging. How are you in this hot day in Chicago, Nick? You know, I'm doing great. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely shorts and t-shirt weather. Like, looking forward to getting outside later today. It just comes on you here, right? It's like it it it's it's cold, 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 and it kind of warms up a little bit, dips in the cold, and then it gets to ninety. You know, so that's we just, we've got we've got right ten seasons spring. here in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, spring, fake spring, <laughs> spring again, winter, that's right. summer. Yeah, <laughs> um. We, we got a lot of cool stuff we're going to talk about today. Um, and uh, Nick, um, whenever we plan these things, and Nick will send over his final slides. And Nick, you, this morning you threw in some stuff on uh, AI, and I think that's such a such a hot topic, and, and everybody's covered it in ad nausea. But I think there's so much going on in manufacturing, even in the steel making world, um, marketing realm um, where I reside, of course. Um, you know, I've even read some stuff about commodities. I mean, it's everywhere, right? I mean, from I mean, it, it, so I think it's great stuff. So we're going to dive into that and then, of course, cover your um, normal commodities update. But um, but before we we let in go into that, I wanted to mention that we haven't had a we haven't had a guest in a while. So um, and and we're going to do that, but we're going to do it on a special episode. We're going to be recording. We do this live the first Thursday of every month, as you know, um, but we're going to be recording a uh, an episode coming up here with Patrick Dempsey, um, not the actor, um, the general manager. From from New Core Steel, I, I don't think I don't think he's the, yeah, the actor. I don't, I don't think know. it's the same guy. Are we going to have McDreamy on here in a couple of weeks. Uh, is that who that is? Yeah, yeah, That's you're right. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, um, could be. You guys can <laughs> on the on the hair thing going on. I, I got to stay out of that conversation. <laughs> Patrick Dempsey from uh, from New Core is going to be. Um, we're we're going to talk to him um, about a few things. We're gonna we're gonna record this as a special episode um, in about a week and we're going to put this up on our YouTube channel um, as one of our podcast episodes and, and uh, a couple of Joe listeners you'll get an email when that's ready um, but we're going to talk to him about a few things but we also want to hear from the audience because you know normally we have the uh, the open Q&A but since this one will not be live um, we're going to put up a poll about um, what you'd like to know you know, what you like to hear from Nucor. You got four options there. First is why the lead times remain extended. Um, two, will utilization rates continue to improve this year? Uh, three, topic of carbon neutral steel. And, and Nick, you can get into this. There's a little, little announcement they made around there. And then finally, some price disparity, right? Um, any, any pricing issue or pricing um, matters that you want to discuss with Nucor. So chime in, let us know. Um, I'm sure we'll cover all these, but um, we we'll really want to kind of bring it to to him. Say the audience is just something that they really want to know. So um, chime in, and we'll we'll look at the votes at the end. Um, Nick, anything you want to add to that that special episode we got coming up? No, I mean, in addition to any of those four questions, I'm I'm sure there's going to be a lot of ad hoc questions from Mike and myself that we'll be able to fire in as well. So uh, yeah. if you don't have specific questions top of mind, don't worry. I'm sure we will be coming up with plenty to uh, to fire towards McDreamy here in a, here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, we, that's what we, got. We, we got to ask him if he gets that a lot. If he gets Absolutely. that confusion a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. No, I'm, I'm glad. Let, let's dive into it. Good stuff today, Nick. Excellent. Stuff let's today. go ahead and do it. So a little bit of a different uh, framework than, than normal. The only real deviation is up on the front end of the presentation uh, or, or discussion. Uh, we're going to have a couple slides and a little discussion around artificial intelligence. Uh, for anybody who has been living under a rock, it's uh, it's certainly a... I don't want to call it a flavor of the week, flavor of the month, but it's everywhere you look, there's a discussion, whether it's on newspaper headlines, you know, websites, CNBC, everybody's talking about AI and it's garnering a lot of attention and it's garnering a lot of money. And, uh, and we want to make sure we address it from not just the perspective of, of the technology world, but also the perspective of the, the manufacturing world. Because I do think that while all this is happening, all this money sloshing around, going into AI, you know, speculating around what, what's going to be the new big thing, I do think there's a lot of a lot being overlooked within our sector, and perhaps things that have been taking place not just in the last couple of months, but maybe things that have been more of like a, a five, ten year type uh, horizon for 
for the development of AI in a lot of our business systems. So we'll, we'll get into some of those details. We'll then hop into the individual metals. And then on the back end of this, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the macroeconomic situation, a uh, brief discussion around the debt ceiling and where we stand with regards to that. And then we'll wrap it up and kick off the beginning of our summer. Yeah, and you mentioned a lot of opportunity with AI, a lot of controversy too. I mean, it's not a day goes by that people are, are talking, is this good? Is this good for business? Is it bad for business? Is it good for jobs? Is it bad for jobs? And then there's there's valid points on each side. So I think this is this is hot no matter what industry you're talking about. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So let's go ahead and hop into it. Before we do, as always, we have to cover uh, the safe harbor provision. These are the opinions of Nick Webb, Mike Carrazzo, these are not the opinions of Ryerson. Do your own research. Uh, this is not investment advice. Um, we, th we think we got some pretty cool stuff here in, this, uh, here in this discussion. So first things first, artificial intelligence. What is it? I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to kind of highlight the, the sections that I've highlighted in red. Uh, intelligent machines capable of performing tasks that typically require hu human intelligence. Um, these systems are designed to analyze, interpret data, learn from experience, make informed decisions, predictions. All of these things should sound somewhat familiar to what we already mostly do in our day-to-day -day lives as analysts, um, you know, ex experts within our, our specific field. The, some of the phrases you may have heard with regards to artificial intelligence, things like machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, and, and probably the one that's most shown in, in the media and entertainment field, robotics, the idea that you have AI actually going into machines that can look like humans and maybe ultimately take over the world with Skynet. Um, but with <laughs> regards to the, the industries that, that AI up to this point has been applicable for, this is, uh, we're highlighting here, healthcare, finance, transportation, entertainment. Now, I say we're, we're highlighting this. Uh, fun, fun little fact, I didn't actually make this slide. Uh, I actually had artificial intelligence make this entire prompt. Um, for those who haven't heard of it yet, I actually utilized this system called ChatGPT, mm -hmm. which you ask it a question, you give it a prompt, and it gives you back a very detailed response, um, similar to the way in which Google would work, but it's much more detailed and story-oriented in, in the way it responds back. Uh, this is a system that was just launched about six or seven months ago. And I think this is really what's garnered so much recent attention into the AI space because it, all of a sudden it's made it very user friendly that, you know, your, your, your parents or grandparents even could hop on this site, mm -hmm. toss in a prompt, ask it to write a story about Mike Carrazzo doing his gardening, and it'll give you, you know, a 10 paragraph essay about Mike Carrazzo and his, yeah. his begonias. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it'll be, it'll be witty. It'll be funny. And it's, it's, Pretty, it's pretty amazing to see, but that's just one specific application of artificial intelligence. But it is kind yeah. of fun to note that this particular slide was made entirely by, by AI. And that's an important note. It, it's, uh, it's a flavor of AI called generative AI. And that's, that's uh, AI that that's, um, really leverages, um, obviously, the technology for creating content. Um, and uh, yeah, so ChatGPT, um, it's funny you mentioned in Google, right? It's, it's some... There's a lot of debate in, in 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 circles. Marketing my world, right? Is is hey, you know, would ChatGPT eventually take over Google, right, or to replace it, right? So rather than, you know, searching, you know, putting in an answer and you get four suggestions of where to go to find that answer, it's pulling that and it's creating an answer for you. However, it's pulling it from these sites, and you know, is, is it credible? Um, you know, obviously anything. I you know, I think you took this paragraph and you 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 ran it by you know, us for, for fact checking, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, so, but yeah, yeah, for those, for those who don't know, Mike, That's the process. Yeah. he resides within our marketing team and yeah. does a lot of our content generation. So this is, this is very near and dear to his heart. And, uh, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, ultimately isn't supplanting uh, things like that, but maybe can be complementary to, mm -hmm. uh, to creating better content, more efficient content as we look forward. And that's just specifically on kind of the marketing content side of things. Yeah, and to, to be to be fair, we we don't leverage that, um, and you know it's uh, it's something that um, that's very much in, in you know up for up for debate about how folks use it. So it's uh, it's still very much up in the air about how to exactly use that. So um, any content that we're we're putting out there um, is original. It's it's from our it's from our um, our experts. Um, 
things like that. But it's good to explore tools like this for yeah, sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what wasn't mentioned in that original description from chat GPT was manufacturing. So I, I subsequently asked uh, chat GPT, I said, how is AI being utilized in manufacturing? So you can see that prompt up in the, in the top left corner. And I, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but ultimately going through these, these six overarching categories, things like predictive maintenance, the idea that you could have a machine or a personal automobile and using stats, you may be able, using stats and big data and you know, uh, law of large numbers, let's say, you may be able to figure out timing in which you'll need an oil change or, uh, or that a tire may need to repl be replaced. And I would say a lot of this is and has been utilized within our, our physical world for a number of years up to this point. Things like quality control, um, the idea that maybe when you're running metal through a steel mill, it's the ability to make very fine tuned tweaks to make sure that the thickness quality is similar across all areas of, of the metal, whatever it may be. Um, again, the, I'm, wrong. The sorry. I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Big River Steel uses some AI to, to exactly how you you described it, you know, owned yeah. by US Steel now, but I remember that's something they do um, with machine learning, right? To, to yeah. improve some quality control and, and, and things like that. And that's kind of the point that I'm trying to drive home is some of these things should sound somewhat, not basic, but maybe they've been around for five or 10 or 15 years because mm -hmm. they have been. Um, so a lot of these things that we that we're calling AI, we're calling it regenerative AI, uh, or generative AI rather. Um, some of these things, with regards to AI, have been in development and have been improving over the last many years. They're not really all that brand new. We are con continuing to see efficiencies and new ways to use them. Um, obviously, things like autonomous robots. Number four, that's the one that it, it gets some headlines. You know, certainly some some kooky videos of robotic dogs running down a forest and jumping onto tree stumps and things like that. Those are, those are pretty amazing and, and very new technologies, but things like process optimization, product design simulations, those are, those are things we've been living with for quite some time. So I do want to make sure that when we talk about AI, um, we're talking about it in, in a broad sense and an accurate sense, that's reflective of really all the industries that can take advantage of this, because I do think there are efficiencies and improvements that really all businesses can be doing. And, and should be doing and, and probably should be getting rewarded for in many ways too, because I would argue that up to this point, I'll show you a chart here in a slide. Uh, there are some companies that are getting rewarded uh, very disproportionately <laughs> relative to other parts of, of the world. Uh, so we'll go ahead and hop into that. But before I do, this is literally just looking at the number of times artificial intelligence is said, the word is said either on public earnings calls or transcribed earnings calls, you can see that over on the right-hand side, it's gone absolutely parabolic in the last couple of months. But this has been something that's been in the making for the better part of two decades. Um, you can see that there has been a little bit of dialogue and it, it really started to pick up steam in let's say 2014, 15, 16, took a little bit of a pause with COVID, maybe had bigger priorities out there, but now we're exploding into this realm. And you know, I was talking to my analyst a little bit ago about, you know, why that might be. I think one of the reasons is truly this chat GPT, the ease of use for anybody to be able to just hop on a website and write a story from one small prompt. That's a pretty, it's just very, it makes you feel it. It makes you understand very vis viscerally uh, how that AI is working in your life. Whereas you're not really acknowledging the fact that your washing machine may be doing the exact same thing to make sure that it is, is counterbalancing weight or heat or something like that. Uh, a, yeah. lot of, a lot of these things get overlooked in my opinion. Yeah, because the AI is everything from voice prompts on your phone to like how Netflix gives you a suggestion, right? For yeah, sure. I mean, if, you're, if right. you're hopping on a website to try and do a return, uh, the person you're talking to likely or maybe isn't, isn't even a real person. Uh, that, will be a, that will be kind of a, an AI type response mechanism. You may ultimately get to a human, but but that's how they help to get a little more efficient in their in their customer service side of things. Do you see any cycles with, I mean, it looks like if you back to that chart, 2008 was that there was nothing. I was saying I was going to go the, where, you know, certain big events happen in the market, right? 20, 2008, of course, you mentioned COVID. I'm just saying do when things are kind of markets kind of turbulent, do you, do you see that maybe? There are people that are talking about, oh, AI coming in, or maybe there's artificial intelligence. I mean, obviously, it probably was, wasn't talked much at all back in 20, 2008, but do you think like 
the what happened in the market over the past five years and in the world five years have gotten people talking more about that because people are, you know, you know, got, you know, jobs replacements or things like that. Do you think that has anything to do with yeah, it? Yeah, I think it's a number of variables. I, I think certainly the aspect that more and more people are going into computer science is, is adding to that fuel. Uh, more and more people are getting into coding type mechanisms. I think that adds to it. I do mm -hmm. think, uh, I think as companies are trying to find ways, and, and maybe this is more of a, a business cycle type phenomenon that in my opinion, as, as we get later and later into a business cycle, things may cool off a little bit. I think there are going to be a lot of companies and people who are going to be looking at ways to make things more efficient, to do more with less. And, and AI is certainly a possible solution for that. So I think all of those factors can certainly play into that to a degree. Nick, I don't want to get too far ahead, but we got a question from the audience that I think is, is very appropriate um, for, for this stage is do you see, how do you see AI matching up to um, a narrative that, that you've been discussing for quite some time, the revenge of the old economy? Is it an augmentation, distraction, too soon to tell? How do you think those two, those two theories match up? Yeah, I, I almost put in a slide literally saying, is, is the revenge of the old economy dead because of this? Um, and and I, think the, I think the jury is out for now. But certainly, if we look at the performance of commodities, or we look at the performance of, say, old school manufacturing companies relative to the companies that are stereotypically more oriented with AI, at least for the last six to eight months, there's been a massive resurgence of the AI companies doing really, really well and commodities manufacturing oriented companies performing less well on a relative basis. So that would be kind of the reversion of the revenge of the old economy or said a different way, the revenge of the new economy. Mm -hmm. I, I still, again, jury will, time will tell which, which end is right. I still think with this digital world progressing, I still am of the opinion that you have to have a physical world to support that, what be it copper, copper wiring, a physical infrastructure to withhold it. Um, so I don't think the relationship can get too far out of whack before it has to come back into some sort of convergence. But certainly for the last couple of months, so that that theme has has not been playing out. So it's a fair, fair point. I'm envisioning like the revenge of the old economy and then the revenge of the robots, right? Come back to your this kind of <laughs> right. right. this, this constant like up and down battle, right? With what's yeah. old economy versus rise of the uh, the robots here for AI. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it's and it's a great segue into this, which is this shows you the performance of one of those key beneficiaries and 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 arguably why a lot of people are on their earnings calls talking about artificial intelligence because they're finding out that they're getting rewarded a lot for talking about it. Um, even if the numbers don't fully yet justify some of these valuations, I think there's hope, there's speculation, there are, there's a potential for this new addressable market within the AI realm that is causing valuations of some of these companies to get pretty, uh, pretty explosive. And what we're looking at here is the, it's about a six month chart. It's actually exactly a, a five month chart of, um, of in, NVIDIA, which is one of the key semiconductor producers. So they're making very high end uh, for gaming, for cryptocurrencies, and now for artificial intelligence. For, as I understand it, some of their higher end chips really aren't being replicated at this stage. So they kind of have a moat around that world. And what you've got on the right hand side is the price of their chart. What you have on the left hand side is the, the value of their market cap. So market cap is no more than taking the price of the stock, multiplying at times the number of shares outstanding of the company. And just in 2023, NVIDIA has grown from about $350 billion in market cap to it actually hit a trillion dollars just a couple of days ago. So over the course of five months, you had a company, a large, large company, uh, almost triple in value. And, and all of this is centered around the excitement and theme around artificial intelligence and the semiconductor's role in that world. And I think that's a good point, a good time to point out. A semiconductor is a physical thing. They are making a thing to support the, the digital world. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because, yeah, you need semiconductors, but you also need copper wiring. You need, you know, silica, you need carbon. You need, you need a lot of these things. Well, we just had a huge shortage of semiconductors. I mean, how does that, uh, could we run into that again? I mean, we just came off of, uh, you know, with, with the, the, I mean, semiconductors going everything, right? And now you said trillion with a T, right? For 
That's right. For this company and like uh, needing all these semiconductors for that, could we run into that again or we're, we're hit with that shortage? I would say we already are in certain types and certain grades of the semiconductors. So uh, mm-hmm. this goes a little bit beyond my, my realm of expertise, but uh, as I understand it, there are certain grades of chips that they make that nobody else can make. Um, and those mm-hmm. specific types of grades, there are some stories out there of these, these chips kind of getting gobbled up and then they wind up on eBay for $30,000, $40,000 a chip. So yeah, I think th- that phenomenon is already happening in certain subsectors of, of the chip market. It yeah. may not be your simple ones that are going into automotive, which is what we would have seen for about two or three years. But for the high grade, high computing power oriented uh, chips, it does seem like that's the case. And now it's now it's kind of a chips arm, arms race, to be honest. And for the audience, I promise we're going to get to steel prices and all the good stuff. <laughs> I did, this is just fascinating to me. And Nick, forgive me, maybe you're going to get into this, but um, I read somewhere that AI technology, you know, there's always the threat of like, oh, it's going to take my job. It's going to replace what I'm doing. Um, I read a stat um, from it's uh, SEM Rush. They do they do um, optimization um, SEO software. They they did a, a jobs report. And they said that AI could generate or create 12 million more jobs than it would than it would replace. Whether that I, I think the 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 headline there is you know I, I think the market experts are saying that it's not going to come in and AI right and sweep and take away all these jobs. It's going to enhance. It's going to create more jobs to support and create the, the services around it, um, make use of what the data is telling us, things like, I mean, do you see it as like a job creator? Or do you see it as having a positive or negative long-term impact on employment? Have you dug into that at all? I mean, my political answer is gonna be it's, it's both. And I do, I yeah. actually believe it's, I believe it's both too. I think there are gonna be some massive winners, massive losers, um, perhaps no coincidence. And, and I don't mean to poke poke fun or I don't mean to make jokes about people losing their jobs or anything, but I would say perhaps no coincidence that companies like uh, BuzzFeed completely went under in the last couple months. Uh, I think TMZ News went under a couple months ago. I mean, these are content creating organizations that may at least in some way have been supplanted by a computer essentially writing its articles for them. Um, now, is that perfect? Is, is, it, is a computer writing an article going to be perfect and right every time? No. Is a human? No. Um, so there, there could be some headwinds within that world to a degree. Mm-hmm. But for sure, I think you get, you get economies of scale, you get efficiency benefits that are going to impact you know, the production of metal, the, uh, the efficiency of self-driving cars and things like that. I, I absolutely think that those things are going to be beneficiaries. And they're going to need, need to be coding jobs, technology jobs, supporting all of those things. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch. But you bring up a, a really interesting point, and I've ju- I'm just showing the image, uh, not without a whole lot of other context, but this was about a week ago, a week to 10 days ago. This image popped up on Twitter uh, for a very short period of time, and Twitter tends to be kind of take action and then ask, ask questions later. And, and this is a certain instance of that where you may not be able to tell from the image, but what came with this tweet was the Pentagon has been attacked and there's an explosion at the Pentagon. And everybody panicked. And what actually happened was showing up in the bottom right corner, you should now see the S&P. So this is the, basically the stock market right in the middle of that, that stock chart, you can see the market sold off pretty rapidly, but it was only temporary because what they discovered was, you know, this is the most videographed, uh, you know, monitored, probably building one of, one of the most in the world. Pretty easy to confirm whether or not that's the case if the building got hit by an explosion. Turned out this image that you're looking at right here is entirely artificially intelligence created. And while that may not seem like a real big deal, this market move that occurred right here for about, let's say 15, 20 minutes was a move of, of about $500 billion in market cap. So I'm not trying to say that this was a nefarious situation, but imagine a scenario whereby a hedge fund puts on a bunch of short positions. They then post this, this photo out there, or post a video out there of AI generated content that's not real content, not real physical world content, market sells off, they then profit on their trade. Um, that could be something that could have taken place. Now, I, I haven't heard any, any stories about anybody getting in trouble for this, but it certainly was a, uh, you know, this is the downside of AI is we, we have his, historically lived with this saying of, you know, seeing is believing. And unfortunately, we're getting into a world where 
see, maybe see it again, verify, and then believe it. Um, you you got to do a little more fact, a little bit more fact checking, checking on your own to make sure that what you're looking at is the actual situation that's being reflected in the physical world. It's it's pretty tricky though. Yeah, yeah, that's anything with AI generated content, images. It's it's take it as a base. Do your research. Do your like you say at the beginning. Do your own research. Do your own homework. Do your do your add yeah, that expertise to it because that's what's gonna. Wow, that's I did not see that. That's that's uh, that's scary. It really is. Yeah, it's a pretty wild one. Um, and yeah. and I'll, I'll admit, I was one of the proliferators of this information. I, I copied the link. I sent it to my analyst. I said, this could be bad. But then I did actually also say, I'm not trying to take credit for it. I said, this should be something that we should be able to confirm pretty easily if this is accurate or not. And and lo and behold, 10, 15 minutes later, it was, it was confirmed to be fake. Um, now, you, you can imagine if this turned out to be a real situation, that a lot of questions, a lot of fear and concerns would be surrounding that. But Fortunately, that wasn't what happened in this in this particular case. But a lot of money moved hands during during that the course of that time period. With that, we are going to hop into the metals manufacturing markets. Um, color chart. Favorite chart here. We are My looking favorite at favorite color chart. I just love it. I love the color. Chart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We uh, we're looking at a heat map of the various regions of the world. Top to bottom, basically alphabetical order. I've, I've segmented out the world, United States, Canada, Mexico, China, up at the top. I do apologize because we're sitting here on the first day of the month. Some of these data points are not yet prepared. Uh, they have not yet been released. Uh, I did refresh this a couple hours ago, but we do have we do have a number of the most important ones. Key ones being the United States, which unfortunately is showing a little bit of incremental softness on a month over month basis. As we look over on the right hand side. Again, for anybody new, if it's below 50, it's suggestive of a year-over-year -year weakness. Uh, we look at Canada. Canada, had, too, has slipped a little bit into a slight cool down. China, China's an interesting one. China, while it may look, slight, it looks slightly positive, 50.9, there was another data point regarding PMI out of China just a couple of days ago that came out fairly weak at like a 48.8. So a little bit of mixed data out of China, but nonetheless, there was an expectation for a number of months that China was going to start roaring back post COVID. And no matter what way you split it, it really has been underwhelming data out of China. And then working our way down, uh, it's, it's hard to miss the glaring red, red dot on the right hand side, which is Europe. Most of the European region is, is going into pretty soft territory. Uh, we're seeing some numbers in the low forties, even high thirties. Those are, those are PMI numbers. We really didn't even see too much of except for, kind of the, the doldrums of, of COVID lockdowns. So pretty pretty dicey numbers coming out of the European region. I'd say relatively mixed, mostly kind of decent-ish numbers coming out of the North American region. Okay numbers coming out of China, except for expectations were pretty high. So it's, it's missing expectations there. But then the two glaring ones down a little bit further down. India continues to run incredibly hot. It's at a 58.7, which is the highest in multiple years. And then this pesky one, which always raises confusion and questions, which is Russia. Russia continues to show PMI prints. Whether we believe this data to be accurate or not, um, this is the data that's being submitted. And, uh, and, and that too is, is suggestive of your, your growth. And it has been for the last, I'd say, six or seven months at this point. So that's the backdrop for, for us getting into some of these metal dis metals discussions. First, we're gonna hop into stainless and nickel markets. I put this, the red line, uh, diagonal down red line, and then the diagonal white support line. We talked about this last month for anybody who tuned in. This is a, a, tech, a technician, if somebody who follows charts a whole lot, they would call that a wedge pattern. Basically, the idea was prices kept bouncing against the support, bouncing against resistance, bouncing against support, and, and had been for the last, I'd say, 18 months, it looks like. And we were inside that, that wedge or that triangle, even up till last month. And I said, at some point, the market's going to have to make a decision. Either it's going to break out to the upside and get out of this wedge and it's, it'll start running, or it'll, it'll come below the resistance line and, and show some softness. Well, a couple of days ago with the weak Chinese data, um, and when I say weak, it was the, the print that came out at 48.8. So it was actually showing the, the uh, negative growth. That was really when a lot of commodities, not just nickel, but crude oil, iron ore, basically anything that had a tangential relationship to China 
took it on the chin a little bit. And, and you can see we've now, nickel prices have broken below that support line and sort of anyone's guess now how, how low we can ultimately go. I tend to be of the opinion that things look a little squishy within the nickel market until or unless China announces some sort of stimulative measure. And that stimulative measure really would have to be centered around infrastructure manufacturing, not, you know, not personal consumption. You know, we, we would want to see something that would be centered around uh, the, the production of new buildings, skyscrapers, or, you know, manufactured parts. So until or unless that, or until or unless that happens, it looks like we have a little bit of a squishy nickel market for the time being. Nick, are we past the point where something like that could or should be happening, right? Because you've been talking about, you know, some stimulus for China for a while. Would they have kind of already reached that point? Or um, I guess it's anybody's guess, but how, how long do, you, do we kind of cross yeah. our fingers that that's going to happen? Well, one analyst, and I'll, I'll, give, I'll give credit where credit's due. It's, it's uh, one of the commodities brokers over at Macquarie, Macquarie Bank. It's, uh, it's an Australian bank. He, he made a pretty, a fairly good point a couple of days ago where he said, the good news in lower prices and weaker markets and bad PMIs is it probably raises the urgency to, you know, the leaders of the Chinese government to say, hey, things are getting kind of kind of dicey. We should probably start to do something. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of a, a scenario where bad news can become good news with regards to stimulative action. Could we have seen it by now? I would have. If we were around six months ago, I would have expected to have seen it by now. Uh, about a month ago, and I can't remember if I spoke on this in the last cup of Joe, but they did, China did celebrate their, what they call Labor Day at the end of April, early May. And as I understand it, you know, several million people were out, out in the streets, out celebrating, you know, doing what you do for, for festivities. And, uh, and many people came out with, with COVID. Um, so they're, it's almost like they're on a, a one or two year lag from everything that, that occurred in the rest of the world. And that outbreak that they've experienced may have, may have fed into some of the weak PMI data, maybe feeding into some of the weak okay. economic data. Um, but again, maybe once, once they get through this particular wave, maybe they view that as a good time to, to launch some sort of stimulus, but it's, it's really anyone's guess. So until or unless that happens, it looks like it's gonna be headwinds for, for commodities. And looking at, I think we've looked at this in the past, but the commitment of traders report, which is a fancy way of saying how bullish or bearish are traders in the market. This is looking at a five-year chart of the commitment of traders report. Basically anything above zero, and I've drawn in the horizontal line, anything above zero would be uh, traders being long or bullish a particular commodity. Anything below that would be they, they'd be positioned short or bearish a commodity. Ever so slightly, they're, they're in bearish story. It's not, it's not anything to, to say sky is falling or anything like that, but certainly you can see over the last 12 to 18 months, there's been a precipitous effort by traders to get more and more neutral and, and then slightly short in, in recent months. So traders are positioned in a slightly bearish fashion right now, which also doesn't help the price of the commodity either. On the flip side of things, looking at the price of Chrome, Chrome's kind of bucking the trend. We, we talked about molybdenum last month as being one that really zoomed up and, and headed back down over the num number of months. The price of Chrome is now at five-year highs uh, per this particular index, which is a South African Chrome index. So South Africa is the predominant supplier of Chrome into the world, the world market. And I think we've spoke on this in the past, but they continue to experience their own little energy crisis where their electricity grid isn't quite able to hold, hold the power that it needs to. Um, and because of that, they're having ration and, they're, and that's impacting the production of a lot of different things, including Chrome, which they are a large exporter of. So for now, we are seeing Chrome prices at fairly elevated levels. That may at least to a degree offset some of the weakness that we've seen via surcharges uh, from nickel. What does it all mean collectively? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, what does it all collectively mean for the stainless steel buyer, right? You see nickel prices hit that low. I mean, what's what does that mean to the to the stainless steel buyer? Right yeah, now? I mean, net net, when you look at the surcharge, and that this is the surcharge of let's say you know any three hundred grade series um, that include that would include nickel in it. Uh, the net impact of the nickel move lower and the chrome move higher, net net, I would say it's a, a slight net negative to surcharges, um, but the two will will offset one another. So it's it's not exactly neutral. I would say it's still slightly net negative to the price of surcharges, um, 
but there is a little mm -hmm. bit of a buffering impact of the Chrome. Okay. And we've talked about a, a number of uh, headwinds that the London Metal Exchange has had. This is just one more, and this is truly as of this morning. Uh, a company out of France, which is called Aramet, they're one of the larger nickel producers, particularly within Europe. And they basically came out and said the London Metal Exchange is no longer an applicable index for their products. So if that sounds familiar, if that sounds like something we've talked about in the past, it should. Um, you know, not trying to pat ourselves on the back or anything, but it, we're continuing to see this theme of the metal, the London Metal Exchange nickel market just is losing its luster as a proxy for the physical marketplace. Again, I don't think this switch away from LME is going to happen overnight, but it just seems like every month or two, we continue to see another, another hit, another uh, negative news story or you know, a fraudulent situation, you know, the short squeeze kicked it all off, but we've seen a lot of uh, additional stories come out about, you know, the market just not being reflective of how the, how the nickel market exists today. And what I mean by that is only about 25% of the world's nickel is really class one nickel, which is what exists within the London Metal Exchange. A lot more nickel is residing within the class two realm, which would be nickel pig iron, nickel mat, uh, they mentioned ferro nickel here in this here in this discussion here, um, but there perhaps there's a you know I, I still continue to think there's there's an opening for some exchange or some index or maybe a combination of indexes and exchanges to step in and create some new new marketplace and I think we're we're seeing the rumblings of that coming and I just wanted to revisit this because I saw this this morning it kind of fits the theme that we've been talking about for a number of months. Yeah, there was one in particular you mentioned a few months ago. Is that gain any head, any any steam? The uh, another exchange. For I, I, my guess is it's gaining steam with steam. regards to the. Yeah, I would guess it's gaining steam with the physical market where they're actually having success in pricing physical transactions. With regards to the financial world, or you know any any domestic North American steel mills picking it up, we're we're not really hearing any rumblings of that just yet. Yeah. Okay. Now on the aluminum side, I know I spoke last month and I said that aluminum on a relative basis looks a little better off than nickel. And you can see it a little bit in the price action here. This is kind of the same chart to a degree where you have this wedge coming down with the red line. You have the white line uh, acting as support. And aluminum actually a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago actually broke above and broke out of that, of that resistance line. Uh, looked like it was going to be a, a fairly bullish scenario. Um, the, I think the weak Chinese data kind of put a put a threw a wrench in that. But you can see it just visually when we compare the nickel chart right here to the aluminum market here. You can see pretty easily that the price action in the last couple of weeks has been much more supportive for the price of London Metal Exchange than it has been for nickel. We really haven't seen things break down just yet the way some may have may have expected. Which is pretty, I, I think it's worth noting because, you know, the, the weak Chinese data, the weak European data, um, you know, that's going to weigh on aluminum markets too. But it seems as though some traders, some investment managers are viewing the fundamentals of aluminum to look a little incrementally better than that of the nickel counterpart. So from that vantage point, it looks somewhat optimistic that we can see things hold in, in and around this area. And then I, again, I think the same reigns true, which is until or unless China announces some sort of stimulus, uh, we see some sort of soft landing, maybe reduction in interest rates here in the United States. Um, I would say there are going to be some headwinds within the price of, of most of these base metals. Similar to the nickel side, looking at the commitment of traders report, so how bullish or bearish are traders? They're they're not they're not bearish, but they're not really bullish either. They're basically sitting almost spot on the neutral territory. It's fifteen hundred contracts, which you know that's only about uh, let's say twenty five thousand tons of aluminum. That's not a real big position when you look when you look back at where uh, these traders would have been a number of months ago. So there really isn't a whole lot of bullishness or bearishness in the investment community in nickel just yet. It's kind of wait on the sidelines, wait and see. I think that probably makes sense given the current dynamics we're seeing in the macro environment. Flipping over to you mean the aluminum? What's so, that? Do you mean do you mean aluminum? You said on on aluminum. Yep, yep. I apologize. Aluminum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, question for you um, on on the aluminum before we move move over. Um, 
news recently, um, Apollo Group, that's in plans to acquire Arconic Steel Mill. Um, the, does that, what, what impact, if any, does that have on the market for aluminum? We'll have to see what news comes out of that. But I would say anytime you've got a private, this is anecdotally speaking, but anytime you've got a private equity company going into a new investment, your normal course of action is to find efficiencies. And, and oftentimes that leads to changes in headcount and often reductions in headcount. Um, so probably going to see something in that, in that realm. In terms of what it means for the customer base and people who buy metal from them, there might be some deviations in the way they, they address or they approach markets, meaning, you know, whether they want to go more heavy into automotive or into, you know, industrial. So that'd be service centers and more, more industrial type equipment, uh, or if they try and shift into, you know, more can sheet or something like that. I think those, those are the things that we don't know yet. Um, th that would be the main way in which it would impact the marketplace. I would say that. Gotcha. Okay. Switching over to the carbon side of things, it really is a continuation of the trend that we talked about last month, which is whether we're looking at China, which is shown in the orange, the blue line, which is North Europe, or U.S. prices, all three of them are, are heading the same general direction at slightly different speeds, maybe because some moved a little further, faster on the upside. Uh, but, but certainly there's, um, there's a heavy correlation between the direction to the downside as we see it right now. Uh, in the last month, we've, we've taken about $100 to $150 out of, out of U.S. hot roll. Europe's about $100, bucks, and then probably 50 to, 50 to 75 bucks out of, out of Chinese hot roll prices. So there has been, on a global basis, with the European slowdown, um, slightly cooler U.S. manufacturing data, and then, and then I would call underwhelming Chinese data thus far, a lot of these markets that had a little bit of optimism in Q1 and early Q2, They've lost some steam at this point in time. Part of, part of that equation is going to be capacity utilization, which is shown here in this chart. Um, and, and that is domestic production slightly ramping up. It's not in a massive way, but you can see that since, I'd say, beginning of the year, we've seen utilization go from about 71%, 72% up to where we are at 77%. We're still not back up into, into the multi-year highs of 80 to 85%, but Production is coming back online uh, domestically, whether it's from North Star or from other, other mills just ramping up, trying to take advantage of the higher prices. Um, we are certainly seeing more tonnage available. So if we looked at this on a month over month basis, we've added about 1% to the utilization number, which rough estimates, I'd say that adds about a million tons annualized uh, for every percent. So it's a, it's a fairly decent move in terms of new production coming to the market. I don't have a chart on this. I know we've talked about in the past. We are seeing imports move up a little bit, certainly not to the extent that I would have expected, but uh, but they have they have crept up a little bit in the last couple of months, just given the fact that there was an arbitrage, there was a gap between where domestic prices went and where foreign prices could be purchased from. And then as we always do with the, with the steel markets, we like to look at the futures curve. The futures curve is not our opinion. It's, it's simply the market's expectation of where they think prices should be trading. The blue line is, a, is, is six months ago. The green line is a month ago. And then the orange line is current, basically as of last night. And all the, it's basically the same shape as where we would have been a month ago, except for one factor. I would say the trough of the curve as we look at it today, is just a little incrementally lower than where we would have been a month ago. So as we look into late Q3, early Q4, maybe the curve shifted lower 20 or 30 bucks. So what that means is there's an expectation prices could go down by a little further than what they would have been thinking a month ago. And I would, I would say there's some, there's potentially some reality to that. And, and the main uh, things I would point to in that would be Europe continues to slow and show some very weak manufacturing data. And the bigger one is China. China China is really weighing on the global commodity and industrial landscape uh, to a fair degree. So in, uh, again, until or, I know it sounded like a broken record, until or unless China, China. announces some sort of stimulus package, I, I think that we've got some headwinds uh, ahead, ahead for us. That's just a recorded line. You can just keep saying it. <laughs> right. We should get an AI to just say that phrase. Over <laughs> yeah, just to generate it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
And then lastly, on the carbon side, steel prices. Steel prices are continuing to defy gravity. And, and I will admit, you know, I, I, I probably called this one, I did call this one wrong. I would have expected plate prices to have, to have converged at a quicker rate. One thing that I underestimated though is the power of the quota mechanism within the plate world. And what I mean by that is when, when any company looks to bring in plate into the United States, when there's a quota, um, once you hit that quota, you're, you're pretty much looking at a stoppage of imports coming into the United States. And we're getting some feedback that certain countries, certain suppliers are actually already for 2023 hitting their quota. Um, so I do think that importation of plate, which maybe historically had helped to better supply the market and keep the market more in line with hot roll, perhaps that's deviated a little bit. And that quota mechanism is actually keeping plate prices into a more artificially widened gap relative to sheet. So I do think that phenomenon is a real one. I do, you know, there might be a little bit of support also added from the, uh, uh, the, you know, the infrastructure bill and things like that. But uh, certainly the quota mechanism appears to be effective and, and playing its role here. We got a question from the audience. Um, does hot roll and cold roll tend to track the same? Now, from my understanding, cold roll is a little bit higher right now, but but I guess we, we always show the the, the chart with the, uh, HR, but the CR kind of tracking the same pattern. Yeah, I mean, the, the end markets that the two go into are slightly different, but for the most part, the correlation between hot roll and cold roll is going to be 95 to 100%. It's, it's very, very tight, the correlation. There are times where the spread can break out if, say, a certain end market is extremely strong or maybe there's a production bottleneck in re-rolling hot roll. But for the most part, that spread, I'd say it's somewhere between 150 to 200 bucks, but the, but the general direction of those moves tend to, tends to be pretty much in line. And if we look at the spread between hot roll and cold roll as of today, I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere right around 180 to 200 bucks. So on the macroeconomic side, I've got a little bit of uh, not so great news. And then, and I think I've got some, some optimism we can sprinkle in as well. But when we look at the ISM, the very first table we looked at was S&P Global slash market. And, but we always like to show both sets of data points because sometimes they can contradict each other. You know, maybe one month we'll see one pointing down, one pointing up, and we, we kind of scratch our heads. Well, this month, unfortunately, we are seeing uh, a, a tight correlation between the two indexes. And unfortunately, the ISM index is actually a, a fair amount weaker you can see up in the top left corner, the headline ISM number came in at 49 points, or sorry, 46.9, which is down by even more. So it's basically a, a faster decline of growth. Um, when you get into some of the sub indices, looking at things like new orders down the list a little bit, looking at backlogs of orders, those are not great numbers. Um, and I will say that you know, anecdotally kind of sur surveying the field of, of people where Ryerson talks to, we are beginning to see some early signs of reductions of backlogs, customers saying we're going to buy a little less, we're going to play a little closer to the vest. And I think that that anecdote is kind of feeding into this, this survey data here, which is those long lead times we've been used to and those extended backlogs we've been used to, those are quickly dwindling. Um, it is worth noting, this is, you know, all this data is looking at it on a year over year basis. So we are comparing, you know, our comps are against a fairly high number. We've, we've seen a number of years of very, very strong, very extended backlogs. Um, but that being said, no doubt about it, this is a, a cooling, a cooling of growth and, and, and actually a contracting of growth because we are seeing some negative uh, figures below 50. So that's, that's the bit of, of bad news here within the manufacturing side. Um, the good news is services, on the other hand, so this is ISM services, while it does look like the growth is slowing a little bit, it still is suggestive of, you know, the services market is continuing to tick along at a, at a decent pace, and that's off of strong comps again. So we do, we are, we are certainly seeing a, a situation where services, leisure, um, you know, go, going to restaurants, bars, that that world seems to be alive and well. And if, if you went out in Chicago here over the, over this weekend, certainly you'd see a lot of places just bursting at the seams. You would not see anything that resembles any type of recession. Um, 
And when we, when we similarly look at things like travel and leisure, this is the TSA checkpoint data. And over the weekend of Memorial Day weekend, we saw some of the highest checkpoint data that we've seen since 2019. And, and that's not even like midpoint of 2019. That's almost the peak of 2019. So some of this data is suggesting very strong uh, mobility trends, services trends, which is which is absolutely keeping keeping the broad markets in general afloat while we are seeing a little bit of cooling in the physical, uh, I'd say the physical goods world, if you will. Another bit of, uh, you know, bright sides, the unemployment rate continues to just chop along the, the some of the lowest levels we've seen in decades. 3.4% basically says we are not seeing any issues with regards to employment. Um, I, I didn't note this, but it looks like within the, the ISM data, the employment number of, see if you're right here, 51.4. That's actually suggesting that employment within manufacturing is getting a little better. So, so many of Many Ryerson employees, many customers of ours should be or may be finding it a little easier to hire employees, which would be a, a welcome surprise or welcome change for our industry. This is a big one. Um, this is looking at the Federal Reserve. Let's see, this is called the Supply Chain Pressure Index. And I don't think we've highlighted this one on the Cup of Joe in the past, but anything that's at zero would basically be average. That would mean that the supply chain is operating as you would expect it to. If it's above zero, as we saw you know, in 2021, 2022, we got up all the way to four. That is four standard deviations away from the normal situation that we would see within global supply chains. So for those who aren't stats experts, four standard deviations is basically like 0.01% of the time. Um, it's extremely rare to see something be that out of whack. What's interesting is as we look at the most recent data, we've actually gone the exact opposite direction. We're now in a situation where the pressure index is not just at neutral or average, it's actually looser by one full standard deviation than what we would have seen in the past. So that may not be the case for metals. If it is, great. Um, but broadly speaking, this is looking at a broad basket of things. So whether that's obtaining a truck or a vessel or, you know, getting eggs, things should be loosening up from a supply chain standpoint. And this is a global index. So, uh, so if you're moving product around the world, things should be getting easier to get places. It's a very interesting chart. I like that. That's, that's really gives a nice picture of supply chain trends. That's yeah, from the and, Fed, and I, Federal Reserve. Yeah, exactly. And, and perhaps, perhaps um, you know, very related, this is looking at the inflation indices. And, and you'll notice a pretty strong correlation in looking over a same time series between supply chain pressure and inflation. I think that, I think that makes um, intuitive sense that the two would be very correlated. PPI, purchasing price index, and the blue line coming down extremely quickly. So that's more of like a wholesale type inflation. CPI, which is the consumer price index, coming down fairly rapidly, though there are some questions if we're beginning to see a slowdown in that decline of, of inflation. And then the PCE, which is the per personal consumption expenditures, that's kind of the, the Fed's favorite index to use for looking at like the core, core type inflation, things that exclude energy and, and food. That one, it's come down, but it's sort of not moving a whole lot. And for that reason, I think there's a little bit of frustration potentially at the Fed to say, maybe we haven't done enough yet, that maybe there needs to be a little more pain still. Um, and, and my analyst and I, we've actually gotten a little bit of pushback when we've tried to suggest that inflation is coming down. You know, the customer came back and said, well, not, not really. It depends, on, it depends on the items you're buying. And I think that data kind of is depicted here in this chart, which shows certain aspects of inflation seem to be coming down fairly rapidly. Certainly when you look at things like the energy sector, crude oil's 70 bucks a barrel, um, had been 125, natural gas is at $2 per MMBTU, that was 10. So there, there's definitely deflation happening in those types of sectors, but you know, wages are very sticky, wages are strong right now as, employment, as the employment picture is strong. So as we sit here today, there's, there's a bit of a flip in terms of where people think the Fed is gonna go in its next meeting. Last month, there was, I think it was like a 60 or 70% expectation that the Fed was going to cut interest rates. Now, as we look here in this second column and the third column, 
there's a 40 to 41% chance that they actually do another increase in the next two meetings. So almost flip fully on its head. It's basically just this notion that as long as jobs remain a plenty and things don't break too much, they're going to stick to the course and at, at the very least maintain interest rates where they are. Um, if they have to, if, if, if AI continues to take NVIDIA to, to a $2 trillion mark or something like that, um, there may be w- more work to be done. Uh, but at you know base case right now, it looks very likely that they're at least going to pause for the next meeting or two and keep rates at five, five and a quarter. Um, or, you know, there is a chance that if, if inflation doesn't come down at the rate they want, they actually have to do another hike. And I mentioned we were going to touch on this. I'm not an expert in this field, but it does look as though the debt ceiling negotiations are going to get uh, figured out in the next couple of days. I, I don't want to put a, an exact timeline on it, but the chart that we're looking at here is actually the cash balance of, let's just call it the cash balance of the U.S. government. So this is basically how much money they have to spend. Uh, it's a pretty interesting chart because as we look at it right now, you can see we're fairly close to zero. Admittedly, we've we've been down around this level a number of times since 2008. So maybe it's not anything to really, really panic over. If you turn on the TV and listen to the headlines, they'll tell you it's time to panic. Uh, but there is an expectation, I would say a very strong expectation, and it's certainly my base case, that the debt ceiling is going to get raised. They're going to be able to print more money and they'll ultimately have more money on the balance sheet to put towards you know, social, social packages, stimulus measures, things like that. Uh, kind of fascinating when you look back at the COVID years and, and even this last wave when they figured out the debt ceiling back in late 2021, it is worth noting that usually when they get these debt ceilings resolved, a large amount of money is printed. And that, that money being printed could lead to, um, but at the very least, it could lead to stimulus, it could lead to more substantial inflationary type type pressures, though. So there is there is potentially some give and take with regards to what you get when you uh, when you do open up the spending the spending limits. But I, my base case, do not believe we're going to default on our debt. I do not believe it's going to be panic in the streets. Um, you heard it here first on Cup of Joe. Yeah. You know, uh, great stuff, Nick. I, I think uh, you know, take, taking this all in um, seems like a mixed bag on a lot of things, and and um, some new charts here this month, and I think some things to to really sink our teeth into. And on that, one of our um, audience members, we had a suggestion for: um, Have you ever looked at PMI data against carbon steel data? And I guess what what would what could we possibly gleam off of that? I don't know. Have you done it? And and is is there something to maybe yeah, I, I certainly have done it in the past. I haven't done it in the last couple of months, but I've, I've certainly run that. Um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, high level, there would be a relationship between the two because if steel markets are doing well, prices are performing well, i.e. I, prices are going up, mm-hmm. you would expect purchasing managers and indexes and, and survey data to look commensurately positive with that. Um, so yeah, I would say there should generally be a relationship between those two. There are some interesting co-variances, co-relationships that exist. PMI versus steel, certainly looking at scrap prices versus steel, that one's going to be a little more closely related. Um, crude oil, crude oil, I think is a good broad metric of manufacturing activity. And as I mentioned, it's kind of, it's soft to sideways at the moment. Um, yeah. I didn't mention this, but it is worth noting that there is an, there's a big OPEC meeting this weekend where we'll, we'll see what kind of rhetoric comes out of that. But they may announce further cuts. They may announce more stringent actions around Russia production. Um, but, yeah, I have certainly looked at it. I think it, it makes some anecdotal sense. My, if, if I'm remembering correctly, it's not a perfect correlation, but there's certainly a relationship between ISM survey data and the strength of steel markets and metals markets in general. That's interesting. Yeah. Might be a good one to, to throw up in the next yeah, next couple of sure. shows. Take a look at yeah, it. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I got to a lot of the questions throughout, some really good questions. Um, but before we go, um, or just do a, do a wrap up, um, as a reminder, we're going to do this new core steel um, interview with Patrick Dempsey, one of the general managers there to talk everything from lead times to pricing, um, disparities, things like that. We asked you at the beginning of the show, what would you like to most hear about from Newport? Um, that's in the, can you see these results on screen, Nick, or am I just seeing this? 
I you can't see them? see them just yet. So you might have to read them out loud or share your screen. No problem. Yeah, I think it must be on my end. So the um, thing people most want to hear about is why do we times remain extended? Um, 57%. Um, next highest at 40% is that disparity between price of a uh, sheet and plate and then utilization um, rates 36% and then uh, the carbon neutral steel. Uh, we're we're going to we're going to touch on all these. And um, I think it's a I think it's a really good really good mix of topics. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, but I guess before we go before I you know kind of give the closing thoughts here I let you give close, close closing thoughts. So, tripped up there. Um, we're sitting here in June, right? Six months in, I, now that you look the back half, the back nine, if you will, of the year, um, the back six, if you will, what are you most watching? What, what's, what, what do you keep an eye on from a metals perspective, right? Like what, what's, what's the biggest trend that you, you that you really, I mean, you got it all, but like what, if you were to hone in and say, this is the thing I'm that, that we should most closely watch or for our customers, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, with regards to price, and I'm, I'm just going to hit my AI auto record button, it's, it's going to be China. I mean, the, the Chinese situation, I know we, we spend a lot of time talking about what China's doing with regards to industrials and metal prices, um, but they matter. And, and to the extent that they continue on the path they are, I think we continue to see prices mostly go sideways, maybe even slightly lower, because they, they are underwhelming expectations in a big way. I don't think it's, you know, counter that against there's an expectation uh, and it's been set by the Chinese government that they want to grow at seven to eight percent GDP this year. The, mm -hmm. the current the current activity does not, in my opinion, suggest that they're anywhere near that pace. So if they're going to get there, something something major probably has to shift between now and the next couple months. So that's something I'm, I'm certainly keeping an eye on. Uh, I think for domestic I think we got to keep a very close eye on backlogs and new orders. Um, you know, I, I, I'd hate to see that trend continue where for, for both Ryerson and for our customers that new orders continue to slip, backlogs continue to slip because that would be a growing trend that things are cooling off in a bigger way. So we're going to keep a close eye on that for sure. I would say those are the two big ones. Okay, great. Um, closing thoughts. Uh, what, I mean, maybe those are your closing thoughts, but you know, so. No, I mean, we talked on AI. We talked about May the 4th yep. last month. We're, uh, Mike and I are a couple of uh, tech, tech geeks now. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes. But, uh, no, I, I, think, <laughs> I think pulling AI back into the discussion, there are a lot of really cool things that it can help make our lives better. I don't believe it's going to immediately take over our jobs. I don't think it's going to kill all of us in the immediate future. Um, I think in there's the a lot of... immediate future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, I think I think finding out ways, figuring out ways for the manufacturing sector to reinvigorate itself is going to be a fun theme for the coming three, five, 10, 20 years. And I, and I think we all should be part of that. Well said, well said. Look out for the email um, in the coming weeks when that episode with uh, the interview at Nucor is uh, up and ready. And then uh, we will see everybody in July. Thanks for joining. Hey, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.